Good morning, everyone. I'm Jim Rooney, President and CEO of the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce, and we hope you are joining us today feeling uh, well and um, maybe a little optimistic uh, today about, uh, about the future. I know we still have a long way to go uh, on this triple crisis of a healthcare crisis, an economic crisis, and a racial crisis in this country. Um, uh, but I know that here in Boston, we're all working hard to create the, the future of Boston and what that is going to look like. And certainly today's conversation is directly related to how we shape that future. Um, this is an important discussion about procurement as an equity tool, uh, something that we talk a lot about here at the Chamber. Uh, some of you are familiar with our Pace Setters program. Um, this is not about that program specifically, although Pace Setters does uh, focus on on the issue of uh, of procurement. Uh, it's really about procurement practices in general and how companies uh, think about their procurement and supply chain uh, practices, uh, and maybe how we can reshape our approach to those things going forward. Um, now more than ever, it seems to me that the business community uh, is challenged with making. Uh, their uh, procurement practices and their supply chain management uh, a priority in terms of making sure that uh, people of color are involved in those discussions. Um, so from my perspective, I'm looking to hear how do we make, uh, how do we create systemic opportunity? We've heard the phrase systemic racism um, injected into uh, the way we buy goods and services and in other dimensions of our business practices. How do we create systemic opportunity? Um, and you know, as we think about procurement and supply chains, um, to what degree are these are there systemic barriers in the way we teach, and the way we practice, and in the way we even evaluate the people in our organizations who who practice buying and supply chain management? So we have a great panel of people who are going to discuss this today, and I'll be introducing them in just a minute. But I do want to begin by thanking our sponsors for today's event, uh, John Hancock and Easton Bank. Thank you not only for your engagement uh, with the Pace Headers program, uh, but more broadly for being leaders in the business community, especially uh, in this time of crisis. Uh, I want to flag that this session is being recorded and will be shared on the Chamber's YouTube page following the presentation. And finally, we will have a, an opportunity for the audience to ask questions. Please use the Q&A feature, making sure that uh, you, you um, direct it to all panelists um, uh, as you ask your questions. Now I'm pleased to introduce uh, our moderator and speakers for today's program. Our moderator is Betty Francisco, the co-founder of Amplify Latinx and Latina Circle, along with her professional role as general counsel of the Compass Working Group. Betty has over 20 years of experience advising health and fitness businesses, life sciences, and technology companies in the areas of legal, compliance, risk management, operations, and human resources. In addition, Betty is a member of the board of directors of Beth Israel Leahy Healthcare System, the board of the Nellie May Education Foundation, and the Investment Committee of the Boston Impact Initiative Fund. Thank you, Betty, so much for joining us and your willingness to moderate today. Next, I'm pleased to welcome David Cho, Chief Procurement Officer of, at UMass. Um, David has over 25 years of experience with operations management, and he has supported more than 50 firms prior to joining UMass, including Apple, Air Canada, and US Airways. As Chief Procurement Officer, David is currently leading a unified procurement services team at UMass, which includes strategic sourcing, contracts, and procurement operations for the entire UMass system. Thank you, David, for joining us today. And I'm pleased to introduce Pat Patterson, President and CEO of Elysium Enterprises Incorporated. Pat is a supplier diversity expert who has worked with Verizon for over 25 years. In his time at Verizon, he led the global diversity and inclusion efforts and nationwide procurement. Pat has served on the board of the Eastern Minority Supplier Development Council, and he won the Corporate Advocate, Advocate of the Year Award from that council. 
Thank you, Pat, for joining us. Um, a great panel for, uh, for this topic, and I'll turn it over to Betty to lead the discussion. Great, thank you so much, Jim, and good morning, everyone. Appreciate the warm introductions. It's a pleasure to be here today with you this morning. I'm excited to be part of this important conversation on how procurement and supplier diversity programs can be used to equal the playing field for businesses owned by people of color. I'm excited to have uh, this conversation with David and Pat. As the country grapples with a racial reckoning and the health and economic crisis caused by COVID, we have an opportunity to step back and look at how individual institutions can change systems, policies, and practices that have historically left out minority-owned and women-owned businesses. I recently led a statewide small business poll that was conducted by Mass Inc. Polling Group. And the poll was done in collaboration with over 80 business services organizations and chambers, including the Boston Chamber. And in that poll, we surveyed about 1,800 businesses across Massachusetts, and we oversampled Black, Latino, and Asian businesses to understand their needs as we go into the reopening and recovery. So as you can imagine, there are stark differences in how our businesses of color are faring. Black, Latinx, and women-owned businesses tend to be smaller. They have fewer employees, lower revenues, face more challenges to growth. They also tend to be concentrated in the food, retail, hospitality, childcare, and healthcare sectors. And which, by the way, these are the very same sectors that were instrumental to the economic recovery after the Great Recession in 2008. One of the questions we asked the businesses was to identify their biggest needs to recover. 80% of Black businesses and 75% of Latinx businesses said that they needed access to capital, such as grants and low interest loans, as compared to 60% of white-owned businesses. And this is the one stat I wanna focus on. 75% of these businesses said that finding new revenue sources or new customers was key to their recovery. And that's in contrast to 55% of white-owned businesses. So this is really important because research has shown that the three largest drivers for Black and Latino businesses to grow are access to capital, access to networks, and access to contracting opportunities. And here's where the larger business community comes in. Corporations and anchor institutions play a pivotal role in the economic recovery by equitably allocating their investments and spending. We certainly have seen some bold efforts to create access to capital for minority owned firms. Every day, a new corporation announces how many millions of dollars in capital they're going to allocate to small businesses, minority owned businesses, women owned businesses. But equal focus must be placed on the demand side of this equation. And that's the procurement of goods and services by our corporations, universities, hospitals, financial institutions, and governments. When institutions intentionally focus on diversifying the supply chain, they foster inclusion and innovation. They ultimately create contracting opportunities that can drive growth and revenue for minority-owned firms. And it's this growth that creates jobs, it builds generational wealth for founders, and can uplift our communities and help reduce the racial wealth gap. As Jim mentioned, programs that help uh, businesses create opportunities for diversifying the supply chain. Programs like pace setters can be tools to move us forward. As uh, speakers today are gonna to provide examples, tools, and best practices from their extensive experience to help companies implement impactful procurement strategies that increase spending and investment with businesses owned by people of color. Now, knowing that procurement has the power to transform our diverse businesses, let's get started with our questions. So I wanna start with you, David. Uh, can you share a bit about what you think the role is for corporations and anchor institutions in addressing the racial wealth gap? Uh, thank you, Betty. Um, good morning, everyone. Thanks for uh, this, this window to, to, to talk to you. So I think for an institution like UMass, it's a no-brainer. The, the mission is to provide world-class education affordably that's accessible to students uh, of all economic backgrounds on an inclusive platform that's dedicated to supporting that diverse community that, that reflects the world around us. So as a forward thinking institution, you would expect a higher ed, 
like UMass um, to, to focus on educating future leaders to solve the problems of tomorrow and, and certainly support emerging companies and industries primarily uh, for the Commonwealth. You know, with, with all this, how can UMass not consider its ability to impact social values like addressing racial inequality? I actually learned um, recently, and you know, I'm new to UMass. I actually just joined uh, last year, but you know, the UMass systems student population is actually more diverse than the population of Massachusetts public high school graduates. Uh, University of Massachusetts Boston campus undergrads are about 60% students of color, making it the most diverse public university in New England, actually. Mm -hmm. So above and beyond the, you know, academic programs, uh, you know, the, the university looks to advance equity in, in everything we're trying to do, whether it's research, public service activities, um, to hiring, and certainly procurement practices. So, you know, from, from my point of view, um, you know, uh, how do, how does supplier diversity kind of help this racial inequality? You know, look, I was, I was co-chair of the diversion, uh, the diversity and uh, inclusion committee for the uh, global finance organization at my previous firm, uh, BlackRock. It's a, it's a large asset management firm. And the analogy I loved about what's the difference between Diversity and inclusion is that diversity is being at the party, inclusion is being invited to dance. And from my standpoint, equality in terms of supplier diversity is ensuring that businesses owned by underrepresented portions of our society have access, access to opportunity, to Betty's point, access to conduct business. And from my small targeted perspective of procurement, obtaining contracts, which formally institutionalizes that access. Thanks, Betty. Right, thank you, David. Uh, so, so getting deeper into that point, how can we use procurement and supplier diversity as an equity tool? Can you share a bit more about how corporations can be intentional about their spend and in supporting businesses of color? If David, you can continue, and then I'll go to Pat. Well, yeah, I mean, it's 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 certainly. Um something that was a theme at UMass well before I joined. Uh, but, you know, it's not just about partnering with uh, an MBE. It has to do with the type of culture you're mandating from your your vendors. And and one big way is to ensure that, you know, you're re-monitoring the participation of women, black and brown businesses, and other underrepresented groups within your contractors. For UMass, it's, there's a, been a real focus, especially in construction and, and trades work areas. You know, this is something we've monitored closely and and have seen real improvement on. So from the, my procurement lens, you know, it's a terrific way to promote supplier diversity because its functional role in addressing suppliers is from an overall portfolio standpoint. Procurement cuts across the entire organization, transcends departments or global footprints, and has the visibility around how are third-party expenditures actually being allocated. So if you look at suppliers uh, as part of an overall spend category, um, you, you can actually see those opportunities uh, across the institution's landscape. So let me give you an example. If um, there's, you, you know, you're an enterprise with a lot of facilities, corporate, customer-facing, data centers, distribution centers, retail stores, you, you will likely have many different providers addressing everything from security, cleaning, landscaping, HVAC, electrical, plumbing, stuff like that. When you look at that portfolio, you can see the windows of opportunity more clearly in this big jigsaw puzzle. You know, there are plenty of enterprise clients that literally have hundreds, if not thousands of providers just to manage facilities. Mm -hmm. So procurement, I think, provides that visibility uh, within those different layers. And if you start viewing other spend categories, marketing, technology, contingent labor, in the same way, you can almost zoom in or out uh, to see where diverse supplier partnerships can fit. Right. Now, Pat, can you, you've been both um, in, in a corporate setting at Verizon, and now you are doing this as a consultant. Can you share a bit more about how you've seen these programs serve as an equity tool? Absolutely, Betty, and thank you. Um, and thank you, everyone, for this opportunity. Um, David, right on um, with that. And, and I believe that, and it, it's, it's crucial for supply diversity and procurement to work together cohesively as a team. In many cases, the first opportunity for a minority or a business of color to have access to a corporation or an institution is through a supply diversity program or, or introduction to someone from the supply diversity organization or procurement. Uh, many times that's the way that they get endured. 
looking for, for potential opportunities. Uh, for supply diversity and that organization, part of their responsibility is not only to mentor and sponsor some businesses of color and diverse businesses, but also to communicate through the companies, through the corporations, the importance of supply diversity. Why should we, why should we be involved with this program? Why is it important for us to work with small businesses and diverse businesses and businesses of color? What kind of an impact does it have to the company's bottom line? Um, what kind of an impact does it have to, to um, the environment, to the culture of the company? Um, so I, I believe it's very critical for the supply diversity program at procurement to work hand in hand. Um, part of the supply diversity program's responsibility is, as David mentioned, is, is also to track and monitor, but also we want to make sure that we share the success stories throughout the corporation so we can help create champions throughout the organization for more opportunities, for more introductions to help these programs grow. Well, so Pat, speaking of champions, what role does the CEO and top leadership play in leading supplier diversity efforts within companies? So what, so if you're, if you're just starting this or you've been doing this for a long time, right, what needs to happen for there to be company-wide buy-in? The CEO, and the, I think it's critical for the CEO to be committed to supply diversity. Um, you know, I was reminded yesterday, uh, a friend of mine shared a phrase with me that actions attract trust. If the CEO is committed and follows through on this with their actions, then the company, the corporation will follow because they trust the CEO, they trust where he's going or she's going. Um, so it's critical. Um, in order for the top executives below the CEO and the rest of the corporation to feel safe about moving forward with approaching or bringing forward diverse businesses or businesses of color, they'll need that kind of support. So if, if they want to make an introduction to uh, a frontline manager, for example, that's been working with or has a, has a, has a, a relationship with a business that they've been working for, working with for 20 years, for example, to introduce a new business, the person needs to be comfortable and feel supported that, okay, I'm going to introduce a new business and I'm going to have, I'm going to have someone support me in this because this is what we, this is where we're going. This is what we're doing. And, um, I, I need to feel, it needs to be a safe environment. And by having these, uh, the CEO's support and commitment and not only doing it because of, uh, compliance, but a true commitment, uh, is critical. And without that, I don't think it's going to be a very successful program because you're not going to have that person's support. Right. Yeah. I mean, I've always, I've always thought of this as it's, it's part of actually a corporation strategic plan, right. Which emanates from the very top. Da David, um, how about you? What role have you seen the CEO play in these programs? Yeah, there's no question that sponsorship from the top uh, is is transformative. Uh, in, in the very first few weeks I started at UMass, uh, I, met, I met with as many people as I could across all the campuses, you know, and discussed a variety of priorities for this new procurement platform that we're launching. And supplier diversity was certainly a theme quite a few folks raised at that grassroots level. Then right after that, I, I was invited to join our president, Marty Meehan, who leads the five campus uh, University of Mass uh, system. And I heard him speak about UMass's commitment to supplier diversity. There was a mind shift at that moment for me. It was clear that, you know, from my own personal perspective, I was here, you know, thinking I would be working solely with a coalition of the willing, but that now I was now empowered to take a much bigger leap with a broader set of stakeholders. So that, that old cliche leadership starts uh, at the top. I mean, it, it's true. I mean, observing how committed our president is to the issue of equity, including through supplier diversity, I think that kind of mentality really manifests itself throughout the organization. Great. Um, so you, you started to talk a bit about, and Pat, you, you mentioned, you know, when you're trying to do this work, you often have to shift thinking, right? There, there's some behavior change that needs to happen. Yes. So how, how can we drive this behavior change in companies so that you know, the, those decision makers you talked about, uh, 
are empowered to promote supplier diversity, are empowered to bring in new um, you know, diverse suppliers. These are often overlooked companies. What, what's the mind shift that has to happen? Well, I think one of the things is many people don't know what supply diversity, <clears throat> what inclusion is. They need to be educated on it at, at a deeper level so they can be properly armed to move forward and also uh, move forward with that case. Um, so what I've found in, in some of my experience at Verizon and post Verizon is that many folks that don't promote or move forward with supply diversity, it, the reason is they don't really understand what it's about. Mm -hmm. So through education, through communication, that helps that word spread through and it probably arms people to have that change of mindset to move forward and say, you know what? Supply diversity is important. This is why it's important. And this is why I need to introduce additional businesses into this fold for these opportunities because it, it helps the company's bottom line. It helps society as a whole. Mm -hmm. and, and David, you talked about how this shouldn't be looked at as a compliance initiative right it's 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 very different so again from your standpoint how have you seen like a system like umass so more on the government sector how does behavior change happen there um listen i'm i'm, I'm certainly a um a, a data guy so you know uh first um certainly the, the defining that diverse what the diverse su suppliers are to that organization is is key and, th and then finding the most elegant tools to measure it doesn't cost much you know while these efforts um are attempting to match social values these need to be data-driven decisions like any other you know sophisticated business case to, to to pat's point um and you know i guess another way to kind of um change that behavior and you know this this next kind of example that comes to mind uh, you know, as Pat talked about champions, you know, and this was a Nirvana moment for me, right? So when you have a bald Asian guy sharing his Nirvana moment, you got to pay attention. <laughs> so, you know, allotting powerful, adequate bandwidth is also key to driving behavior and, and providing empowerment. You got to carve out the time to ensure your high performance team members are driving this. You know, you, you increase the chances that people will listen to those who already have institutional equity and influence. So I, I'm not, I know I'm not making an, I, I know I'm not surprising anyone when I say that, especially to this audience, um, that people of color do not have to be the only ones driving the diversity uh, agenda. Any high performer has to drive this agenda, and, and that's how behaviors change. It's a, it's a, it's a coalition of, of that um, uh, uh, group of people who, who want that to be integrated into that culture. Right, right. Well, I, I want to shift this a little bit now into the more tactical side, right, of procurement. So we know that, um, you know, the, the profession has often focused on things like, um, you know, low cost, multi-year deals, consolidation, right? How do you find a single supplier that can serve multiple sites? Um, and, and, and now we're talking about uh, balancing that with an equitable spending strategy. So what are some of the factors that companies need to prioritize, right? To see their, their spend increase. Um, how can we maybe reimagine those KPIs, right? Which are cost, multi-year, like how do we think about that differently? Do, Pat, do you wanna start? Um, sure. One of the things that, that can be done is, it, in many cases, it's the larger non-diverse companies that win some of these larger contracts. Um, what corporations and, and institutions can do is to make sure that and set goals around this where these non-diverse corp companies make sure that they work with diverse businesses. They mentor these diverse businesses and help them grow. Cut, give them a piece of the pie, for example. Um, also, with, with some of these larger contracts, instead of having just one large non-diverse business have this contract at a low cost, carve a piece of this out for a diverse business. Give them an opportunity and help them out. Um, I, I'm reminded of an example that, um, and I, I, I'm not gonna share the company that did this, but they were working with a, uh, a small diverse company 
and they had an opportunity that was not part of the strength and, and focus of the small diverse business. But because they liked that management structure of the business, they gave them that opportunity. So in essence, they actually helped them create another line of income and a line of revenue for this small business and they helped them grow. Mm -hmm. And in turn, that business started to bring in more people, more diverse businesses to help them out. So just by carving out a piece or giving a small diverse business an opportunity outside of this larger contract, um, right. you know, a very, very long way. Yeah, and, and I love that because this has been talked about also in government contracting, right? Like breaking up these contracts into smaller ones to allow these uh, smaller um, diverse businesses an opportunity to play, right? Because right. they may not even be of the size that can manage a, you know, a, a, a prime contract. But if you break them up, mm -hmm. it creates more opportunity. Dave, right. um, how about you? What, wh how do you, how have you seen, you know, UMass or even BlackRock balance, right? These two principles um, around the Absolutely. KPIs versus equity. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll get a, a I, I think um, Pat articulated that strategic vision very nicely. So I'll get, I'll get a little more tactical on that same theme around underlying suppliers with um, strategic uh, partners, right? So, um, right now, there's kind of an evolution of, of how fees are actually being structured. So, uh, you know, the, the commercials tied to a partnership are changing from your typical P times Q transactions, which is, you know, your per unit cost times quantities or other similar variable costing methods to more outcome based fees. So instead of charging, instead of, you know, how much are you going to charge me per hour, it's starting to move to, especially with strategic partners, how much will you charge me for an outcome? And, and that's the same thing when it comes to these more sophisticated contracts that require service level agreements, uh, SLAs. So these are commitments of performance as part of the service of product delivery. But they, need, they mean nothing without the teeth behind them. So if, if you, partner, you, you don't deliver a proper repair of a service in four hours, like you guaranteed in our contract, you're getting penalized by a certain percentage of your fees. Again, outcome-based. Mm -hmm. So in both of these examples of fees and service levels, there are you know, outcomes and, and fees and penalties tied to it. So you can easily tie the supplier diversity targets as part of those arrangements with primary suppliers who manage a portfolio of vendors. So for example, you know, awarding business to a general contractor for a major capital project under the condition that at least 20% of that spend goes to at least say 15 diverse subcontractors, different trades. Uh, many times suddenly you'll see those partners already have a list in hand of diverse partners ready, you know, but you have to call that out as a requirement. And again, tie that outcome to dollars. Right. So that, so there's intentionality around the outcomes and then how do you incentivize this behavior within, um, procurement group. So for example, Pat, you, um, at Verizon, um, you were part of a performance-based structure, right? That was tied to supplier diversity metrics. So things like bonus and compensation of employees and top executives. Cool. Is this a best practice? Is this something that, that is necessary um, to accelerate this type of change? Or are there other ways to create incentives? Um, I think that's, this is, that's one of the ways. Um, in some cases or many cases, it, it, it may be necessary um, because, you know, as they say, when you hit someone in their pockets, that's where it hurts. Um, but what we found is most people didn't even realize that part of their compensation was tied to supply diversity. Mm -hmm. When we found that out, that's when the conversation started. Why is this important to me? Well, not only because of your short-term incentives, but here's the business case behind supply diversity. This is how you can help supply diversity uh, spend increase. This is how you can help opportunities improve within the supply chain. And this is why it's important. And as a result of that improvement, your compensation may increase. So that, that could be one of the ways. Um, certainly there are other ways where, you know, in, in many cases you have a number of supply diversity champions within an organization, within the corporation. Um, shout them out. 
You know, um, there, are lot, there are a lot of internal websites uh, within the corporation. Give them a spotlight. Say, hey, you know, this individual helped bring in $25 million to spend via these diverse businesses. And in turn, we've given this person whatever uh, as far as a, uh, as, a, as a prize, so to speak. Top uh, performer or recognition, yeah. Correct, a vacation in Aruba. I mean, you know, it, it could be <laughs> many, many different things. But, um, you know, um, and it, it's a way to raise awareness as well. So um, a lot of people, you know, they like to be in the spotlight sometimes. That's another opportunity for them. Um, but also do the same thing, not just with the employees, but also with the non-diverse businesses. You know, you're going to have, you know, for example, I, I recall um, at Verizon, we had some companies that had over 40, 50 percent diverse spend at a tier two level. And we would shout them out. You know, we, we would have events and say, you know, these companies did great. And, and this is the results that they had. Mm -hmm. So there, there are a number of ways to do it. Um, work with the employees, work with the non-diverse businesses. Um, and and it's, it's all beneficial. It all works out really, really well. And, and you'll notice the, the tides start to shift um, through the corporation and also in the industry. Right. Well, that's, uh, um, I, I think, you know, incentives, like what you just mentioned, sort of, I think of salespeople too, right? That you, they, they go for the top, I think motivating some of this behavior through compensation incentives is, is, um, can be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, while also, um, I think another key incentive is just feeling like you're empowered to help build strategic partnerships. That to me personally is, is another great driver that you were part of creating other ripple effects, right, in the business ecosystem. Yeah. David, with you, um, let's go back to BlackRock, your BlackRock days. Um, so as a global investment management corporation, your work helped to turn around the supplier diversity efforts there. Can you share a bit about the challenges and successes that you experienced in your procurement role there? Sure. So, you know, so for, for those of you who don't know, BlackRock's a global organization that's a, a traditional asset management firm that's in the middle of a transition right now, uh, moving into a market leading fintech firm as well. And it has a rich global culture where diversity is defined based on where you're sitting that day in the world, because each country has unique diversity considerations. So, you know, procurement for a while was actually tied to the co-president who was the first employee at BlackRock. You know, he told me he had procurement um, have that connectivity to his office for two reasons. One, he wants to get a pulse of what's going on in the global organization and how are the global lines of business institutionalizing partnerships. And secondly, he knew that, you know, to, he wanted in, in the departments across the globe to know that directives coming out of the procurement organization came from the president's office. You know, it was one of the best roles I've had in my professional career, frankly, because I learned tremendously, you know, uh, under him uh, until he unfortunately passed away. The other co-president, you know, expressed BlackRock's desire that investment teams from other companies, whether they're diverse or not, that serve BlackRock, had diverse account teams. Again, baby steps, not in the papers, just on a day-to-day -day execution basis. You know, the, the challenges, look, there were a lot because it's, it's going to be the same as any large organization that's uh, faced to, to drive this mission. Um, but, you know, it's, a, it's an organization that certainly tried to hire talented people that, for the most part, are striving to do the right thing. And, and frankly, that helped me realize over time I wanted to serve, you know, a, a different and high, higher purpose. to so, so to launch this procurement platform at UMass was my no-brainer. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the success is... It was, you know, the culture, look, the culture was about taking calculated risks. And, you know, I got to do um, many of them. And as I completed what I said I would, I got to do more. So the examples that I think that Pat and I um, are, are talking about over the course of this conversation, you know, I got to execute on those. So enough said, you know, that, that, that in itself, I think was a success. That's great. Thank you. And now, Pat, um, tell me about your new firm, because you are now... Um, on the consulting side, you're helping right, other institutions launch these programs. So can you share a bit more about Elysium Enterprises um, and what you're doing to help companies um, achieve their supplier diversity goals? Oh, thank you, buddy. I'd love to. Um, 
What we do is we work with corporations, uh, educational institutions, government agencies to help them either create or expand and improve on their supply diversity programs and also some of their DNI programs. Um, so, for example, you know, with, with, with many of the things that have, that have been going on in the recent six months to a year or more, um, DNI and, and supply diversity are being highlighted. Um, if anyone takes a look at Indeed on a regular basis or LinkedIn, you see a lot of opportunities for, we're looking for a DNI vice president or a supply diversity director here or there. Um, what we do is, is step in and work with these companies to help them. First of all, we put together a business case so they understand the importance behind it. Um, then the most, one of the most important questions after that is what are you committed to doing? You know, is this again, are you, is it a true commitment? Are you going half in? Are you just dipping your toe in the water for compliance purposes? So that's, that's something that, that they have to be real about. Um, they tell us they're fully committed. We move forward and, and we either create a program. Um, in some cases, um, they didn't have enough bandwidth within their supply diversity organizations to report out accurately on their numbers. So we step in and identify the low hanging fruit. Hey, you have um, 10, $12 million of diverse spend that you haven't identified yet. Um, these businesses have been working for you for years, but you didn't know they were diverse. Um, you know, we, we help, um, we've helped the law firm actually uh, create a DNI program um, in, in the legal industry, which is something that's, that's been needed and, and very necessary for a long time. So these are some of the things we do. We, we, we walk in, we, we analyze their comp programs if they have a program, help them identify opportunities for improvement, um, introduce them to new diverse businesses that they may not have worked with before and help them grow their programs. And also, you know, we can report out and help them set up dashboards to report out on, on, the, on the great results. Yeah, that's fantastic, Pat. I wish I could hire you. <laughs> my own. So, so I have a question for both of you on this. So I, I, I'm at a nonprofit and we, um, you know, have taken as part of our diversity and inclusion strategy do have a component around supplier diversity, but we don't have a, a policy developed yet. Right. So we, we've taken baby steps whenever we can to, um, you know, look at engaging diverse suppliers whenever, you know, we, we have a contract opportunity or even at an event, right? We're using um, diverse caterers or perhaps even, um, you know, uh, speakers, right? That reflect our larger um, uh, community of color. How can a, a business start, right? So, I, and, I, and, and I'll just say at Amplify Latinx, we made a commitment early on to try to use Latino businesses as much as possible, right? So our accounting firm, our bookkeeper, our um, marketing firm, our website developer, every, every, everywhere we can, right? We use a Latinx owned firm to prove out this point that it can be done. Um, so, but how do we institutionalize that, right? So can you share, both of you, um, where do you start? What does a policy look like? You know, where can we go for resources? David, do you want to start us off? Yeah, uh, and you know it's funny because uh, we we at UMass we we just launched this new centralized uh, procurement function for to support all the campuses. It was launched in January, and then COVID struck. So obviously there have been um, a shift in certain priorities. So we're trying to build the plane while we're we're flying it. Um, so we're building these new templates now. Uh, you know, with RFPs that ensure that supplier diversity requirements are in, you know included. Um, and you know, uh, what one thing I'm actually again you, to your point, these are these are baby steps, right? Before before uh, you know, just getting visibility into what supplier diversity is at UMass and and how that is segmented uh, across our supplier portfolio, uh, getting that visibility. That's all stuff that we've been able to do now. Um, but here's another example. I'm I'm actually really proud to announce here for the first time, um, you know, we just launched this week, a new supplier portal at UMass. Mm -hmm. And um, after this forum is over, and actually it, these emails might be going out right now as we're talking, we are inviting all Paysetter suppliers to register with UMass. 
identify as diverse suppliers, share their credentials, and they will now be able to see the pipeline of opportunities and competitive processes that are in flight uh, and that they want to, that they, they can participate in. On the flip side, our constituents at UMass can now see them as potential options to partner with. So I think whether it's a wholesale you know, policy uh, um, change or you know, these um, you know, tactical improvements right, uh, you know, into your processes, into your competencies of your people, and certainly into your technologies to integrate that, that those are all um, uh, methods that you know you, you look back you look back and again a transformation happens right so um, you know I, I I like the baby steps analogy you gave Betty yeah and and Pat what about um, you where where can where can one start um, there are a lot of resources out there you have you have businesses such as mine that can that, that can help people uh, help companies start but you also have resources like uh, the National Minority Supply Development Council. They have a number of regional organizations. So for example, in the Boston area, you have the Greater New England Minority Supply Development Council. Um, you have WeBank, Women's Business Enterprise National Council. They have a number of regional organizations as well. And, and the New England area has, has one of their regional offices also. Um, so there are a lot of um, resources out there um, that can help set up and help help structure or give advice to help you uh, create and structure a, uh, a, a program. Um, but a lot of times, some of those councils, they, they can't give you the in-depth or the, they can't commit a full-time person to help you do this. So that's where businesses, um, you know, such as, as mine, others that do this can really help you set up a program and, and help you towards success. Yeah, no, thank you. And I, I, I fully um, believe in engaging, you know, consultants like you, like you, but also like leveraging each other, right? There's so much expertise here and also within the chamber, right? We, the, we don't have to reinvent the wheel all the, all the time. So I want to start shifting us to audience questions. I think this has been a great conversation. Um, and, and there's one here from uh, uh, Raju, um, he's asking about what is our take on large companies saying um, that we have to keep our supplier database small. Um, I guess, you know, this is sort of the question of the large, big contract, um, uh, like a Deloitte, right, that takes care of IT for an entire company. You, you sort of addressed this before, um, but any further thoughts on, you know, how do we include small minority businesses? in um, say a systems wide kind of a procurement need? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll grab that if you want, David. Um, one of the things when I was part of, when I was on the board of one of the councils, the Capital Region Council, I was the chair of the education and um, training committee. And one of the things I used to share with folks is, you may not have that tier one direct contracting opportunity with a large corporation because you may not be large enough in scope um, for, to, to, to be attractive for them to want to work with. So find out who they're contracting with and become one of their tier two, one of their subs. So for example, is it more important for you to have a direct contract with the larger corporation or is there an opportunity to have five contracts with some of their primes as a diverse supplier. So see, and, and technology is a wonderful thing these days. Um, you can find out a lot of things um, just by doing some research on a computer. Um, you have access to many, many things. So many times you can find out who some of these primes are that you want to target. Yeah. So a couple of people have asked this. So, so sort of two related questions. One is, how do you um, diversify goods, right? So one thing is services. The other is, is goods. Like let's say, you know, you're buying toilet paper. Like what, well, how can you diversify your supply chain there? Yeah, uh, I, you know, I, I think, again, it's it, the tough part for smaller businesses, uh, you know, is they don't have that scale to have a marketing arm and, and to make those types of connections. So, uh, you know, as as institutions interested in doing something like this, I think these, you know, proactive methods of outreach, um, you know, because you'd be surprised at how many um, 
you know, pings people provide over uh, uh, social media, right? Uh, you know, they're, they're, every, everyone is trying to promote their businesses, but they don't really know how to do it. And, and um, a lot of larger companies who are the buyers, you know, don't have the even ability sometimes uh, to, to know who these diverse suppliers are unless they are actually going out and making that, you know, proactive outreach. So, you know, I spoke to, um, uh, you know, a, a former CPO of a, of a major bank last week, you know, they hosted sessions on, you know, here's, here's a, here's a one-on-one around the, what's the criteria that's important to us. Uh, and it's pretty eye-opening because it's very different regardless, you know, these companies can be in the very same sector, but they have a very wide variance of, you know, here are the goods that I'm, I'm looking for. Um, and being able to share what it is uh, that's important to them from a, a goods standpoint was, was not something that a lot of these smaller firms knew about. So I think these proactive sessions, I mean, you know, UMass, look, UMass has one of the best medical schools in the country. Its CFO told me he's ready to walk through uh, to introduce UMass as a buyer to diverse suppliers uh, and have a forum like that, right? And if, if anyone at Paysetters wants to do something like that, let's brainstorm. You know, we, we can be a coalition of companies that, you know, offer this up and, and you know, create at the right time. I, I know it's, it's hard to get, get ourselves out there right now physically, but, you know, we, we can have these vendor fairs where the, the, these smaller uh, fir firms, uh, especially diverse firms, can can promote their their goods and services, right? So I think, you know, uh, that's one. But you know, the 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 most the fastest effective uh, way that you know I, I've been able to accomplish this, at least you know, at BlackRock is the subcontractor route, right? Just being able to partner up with primes, let them know this is important to us, uh, and here's the target. Let's do this together. And you know, they 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 now realize, well, this million dollar contract can suddenly turn into a two or three million dollar agreement. They're motivated, right, to 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 match those social goals, especially if you're pro providing those financial targets to them. Right, right. Now, th this this also has come up in how do you um, prioritize or incentivize local businesses spending in local businesses versus national. Um, is could you speak to that? Like, one is how do you find them, and but how do you also um, justify, right? Spending with many, many local firms. Uh, I could take this one first, Pat. Uh, you know, with, with, um, with UMass, you know, I think we're, we're, one of the question that Raju asked earlier uh, around vendor consolidation is certainly a goal that um, uh, a lot of institutions have because there's an administrative burden of having too many vendors to manage. So there are opposing forces here, but, you know, with, with UMass, the, portfolio is 17,000 vendors. We are an institution with a footprint just in the state of Massachusetts. So, uh, you know, being able to have that access, um, that, you know, being able to have that connectivity with the local communities, it's, it's, it's just, it naturally happens, right? So there is a lot, a lot more um, outreach. There's a lot more that we're planning to do once we can, um, you know, um, get, get uh, outside of our homes. But, you know, there's, uh, I think that that proactive uh, outreach uh, and, you know, many times when we even we've started to have these competitive processes, we'll even share what is it that we're looking for? Because a lot of times people are just seeing RFPs. They're not really seeing the full context. Like what is the entire pie of opportunity? Right. Uh, and so I think, you know, being able to share that information proactively uh, has, has been able to allow us to cl uh, connect with more firms we probably wouldn't have been able to partner with. Mm -hmm. Pat, anything to add there? Yeah, absolutely. And, and David, thank you for that. That, that was great. Um, one of the things that, that we did at Verizon, and it, it's similar to many other regulated um, companies where you, you have a national footprint, and because you have a national footprint, you work with larger businesses that most of the time are not diverse. However, you have local or regional responsibilities as well. Um, so one of the things we did was we put together um, teams to focus on those states or on those, on those municipalities, just to focus on bringing in vendors that are diverse from those areas to provide them with opportunities. So we analyzed the data. I'm also a data person, David, uh, like yourself. We took a look at the data, found out where's the most spend, what organizations does that spend lie in, 
bring in the decision makers from those organizations as part of the team and introduce them to some of these diverse businesses. And just as a result of doing that, I remember the first year, we had the highest numbers in each of those areas across the country than we had ever seen. So it, it's, it's, it has to do with putting additional focus and resources in those areas, and that can make that difference. Yeah. So um, to, I, I think you covered this a little bit earlier, but just another question came in around, how do you incentivize the GPO? What parameters do you use? So th this is a um, uh, group purchasing organizations, I presume. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, these are, these are consortium buyers, right? So it's basically aggregating volume so that, you know, you can, you can uh, influence, um, you know, stronger concessions, for example. And, you know, um, one of the things that we've started to look at is, you know, um, joining them, not only as uh, um, kind of a, a member that gets the benefits of those high volume contracts, but as, uh, you know, our, our head of sourcing, uh, just raised his hand, volunteered to, to um, uh, be a, a, a member of this council that can actually help shape uh, one of these GPOs and, and what, you know, determine, you know, what's the direction, strategic direction that, that these contracts will take. Because, you know, a lot of these contracts, especially for higher ed, um, share a lot of these agreements. So uh, I think, you know, being able to be a, a proactive member, look, I mean, even with uh, organizations like pace setters, you know, there have to be proactive members, right? It's, it's, you know, you're not just, you don't want to just be there taking information, but you want to provide and you want to help course correct and pro provide influence and direction, right? So I think, you know, if, if you can become members of these GPOs that um, uh, are not, are not just focusing on, you know, the best costs, uh, but, you know, uh, ensuring that their RFPs include supplier diversity requirements uh, that match our social values. You know, I, I think that's, that's a, an easy way to do it. Great. I have, I think we have time for one more question. Um, that, and there's a couple of really good ones, but I'm going to do them in order. So this last one is, how can we, can you speak a little more on how we can uh, ensure minority economic participation with policy. So can you, and for example, can you um, speak to say the Massport model, right, which is policy driven? Like how, what role does policy play in driving these procurement strategies? Um, well, you know, I, I guess, you know, I'll take a first crack mm -hmm. at it, Pat, you know, I, um, you know, again, we're, we're still very young in our maturity, right? So we launched in January. So we're, we're still harmonizing our overall policies, uh, procurement policies. But, um, you know, so certainly if, again, this is, this is an, almost an extension of uh, the question earlier on um, leadership. If, if leadership says that this is the mandate, this becomes an internal policy, for example, uh, then it drive, you know, it certainly, it could certainly drive behavior, right? Um, you know, there's, uh, if, if, if there is that uh, specific target, it's not just we want to increase supplier diversity, but specific outcomes, prescriptive goals mm -hmm. uh, that are presented in that policy. Uh, then it's very binary. Are you compliant or not, right? So, mm -hmm. the, you know, to pr provide that, that, um, evidence um, uh, and, and, and the guardrails around how to implement that, I think, you know, it, it creates a lot more creativity when people realize, you know, that that's what I have to do. It's not, it's not about whether I want to do it or not, you know, and, and sometimes some, some, you know, departments or organization or individuals need that kind of motivation to, to, um, you know, add that to, you know, the, a lot of the commercial activities that they already have to do, but, you know, that's, uh, that, that, that can work. Right. I don't know, Patrick, do you have any other view on that? Um, yeah, I agree completely, David. Um, uh, if, if it's written, then people more likely pay attention to it, uh, especially if it's, if it's written down and, and um, put out by the, the head of the organization or the CEO. Um, also, when they, when they find out that the CEO pays attention to it, um, so, for example, during my time at Verizon, we had, we, had, we had goals, annual goals that we had to meet for supply diversity. 
every year those goals were reviewed by the CEO. And I recall uh, a couple of years where the CEO said, no, nope, that's too low. And we, we had data to back it. Why we, pull, we, pull, we, we chose that number, nope, too low, raise it. You can do better than this. Right. And, and they were right. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it, as far as using policy to drive supply diversity, um, in many cases, it has to be done. Mm-hmm. It's got to be written. Um, goals have to be set. Um, and what, it's also important that one number across all lines of businesses is not necessarily the right number. You want to be realistic. So for example, janitorial and real estate may have a higher goal than something along the lines of legal or finance, just based on opportunities. So you want to, you want to have the policy in place, but you also want to be realistic about what you're looking for. Great. Well, listen, Pat and Dave, thank you so much for sharing your amazing insights. This has been a fantastic conversation. I know we're running out of time, so I want to turn it back to Jim to close us out. But Great. <clears throat> Thank you, Betty. Thank you, David. Thank you, Pat. Uh, fantastic conversation. I enjoyed it quickly. As one of the architects of the mass, so-called Massport model, uh, policy is critical. Aspirational statements, goals uh, are all great, uh, but until it is made a part of of the way we do business uh, as Massport declared in that hotel RFP, um, it won't change. It'll just be another aspiration or a statement. Um, I I think this is, as I said at the beginning, a critical, critical topic. Uh, I think the way we practice and evaluate um, supply chain management, uh, the way we teach it. uh, I looked at the curriculum of two universities Uh, on supply chain management degrees over the weekend, as I was thinking about this subject matter, none of them have issues of diversity included in the curriculum. Um, They talk about data, they talk about, you know, large scale buying, they talk about um, uh, all of the practices that we teach people in procurement, uh, but they don't talk about this as sort of part of it. So I think it's the way we teach, I think it's the way we practice, I think it's the way we measure. Great conversation about measurement. Um, uh, David, you set me up nicely uh, for an announcement about the Pace Setters program. Uh, on August 26th, we're going to be launching a series called Doing Business With. Uh, and over the next, uh, for the rest of this year and into next year, we will feature deep, different Pace Setter companies. We're starting on August 26th with a session uh, Doing Business with Gilbane. So anyone who's interested in uh, listening to how Gilbane procures, what they procure, you know, lifting the fog of procurement away from uh, the way construction companies think about it. Uh, tune in on August 26th. On September 22nd, doing business with the Boston Red Sox. Uh, anyone who's interested has a good or a service that they, that they uh, offer that might be of interest to the Boston Red Sox, tune in. And we'll be announcing more over the rest of the year Uh, in this Doing Business With series of major companies uh, within Greater Boston. So um, we're going to continue with the Chamber to advocate on uh, this issue of procurement. As Betty said in the introduction, this is directly linked to the economic gaps and the wealth gaps that we have uh, in this city and in this country. uh, And it's time for the business community to step up. Uh, Thank you all for joining today. Thank you again to our panelists. Uh, And we look forward to having continued dialogue on this subject matter. Have a great day.